Excellent. So it looks like a lot of you already have some um, pretty solid experience in the classroom, which is really important as you're thinking about going into our program. And it's one of the things that's going to be asked about um, as you apply. So first of all, why do you want to be purple? Henceforth, the purple. I come from Wisconsin. I was red, but now I'm purple. So one of the greatest things about this program is that you can be a licensed teacher in Kansas in a year. You start in the middle of May and you graduate at the beginning of May the next year. So it is solidly a 12 month program and uh, within that time you're getting both a master's degree and you are going to be eligible for a Kansas teaching license. One of the things that Dr. Vance is really clear about and, I, and he mentioned this right away, he's a money man, lay it out right up front. How much is it going to cost you so you know how you can budget to it? There's really no hidden fees in there. You know it's going to be just over $15,000 for a master's degree and eligibility for a teaching license. Um, I know a lot of places when I was first looking at my PhD, so many places you had to sign up and you had to really start looking at your coursework and it wasn't really sure how much it was going to cost. Here you are, you know how much it's going to cost. Um, it is absolutely amazing being fully online. You can take this from wherever you are. And our person from Seoul, who is Travis, um, you don't have to get up in the middle of the morning, 3 a.m. to attend classes because it is fully online. It is asynchronous. And any synchronous class or time that we ask people to do, there quite often are either, um, because we know time zones, there's two options, so you can choose the one that works best with your schedule. And if neither of them actually do, well, then we have recordings. So this program is designed recognizing that um, you are in lots of different places and we will definitely work with your schedules. The other nice thing is we work with you wherever you are. And we have people, I think the last count we had was some 30 states were in seven countries and four continents or something like that. We are all yeah. over the world. Am yeah, I right? It, yeah, it, it's probably more like 40 states now and uh, 10 countries, but yeah, that's close. So we work with you wherever you are and your practicum and your student teaching, we work with your local school districts to find yourself a placement. And if that doesn't work, we have some magic Sheldon robots that we can make work, which is absolutely amazing. So if you're wondering, well, if I'm in a weird place, is this going to work? We can make it work. It is highly personalized. So if you join our program, you're going to have our grad cat, which most people know as a teaching assistant, a grad cat who is a master teacher themselves. So they are in the teaching profession and they are working on their graduate degree also as a, a doctoral student, they are going to be with you through your entire year. So you have a consistent person, even as you move from one um, class to another, one instructor to another, you will have that grad cat who will be your advocate and help you navigate the things that are going on and interact with your um, instructors and professors. Our program is high, high quality, and it's one of the great things about K-State and why I'm so fortunate to be here. Our instructors are not adjuncts. In so many other places, you'll have an instructor that will just be hired for one course. They're not paid very well. They may not have any benefits, and they're trying to put together a whole bunch of courses just so that they can survive. And so it's really hard to be a great teacher under that kind of pressure. In our program, all of our faculty members are tenure track or full-time assistant professors, and they're experts in their field and leaders in their field. So these are the people who are doing research, writing reports, giving presentation for the national organizations. And so you know that the quality is going to be really strong. Then our cohorts themselves, as you've just shown here, we're from all over the place. And so as you start getting into your coursework and you're with your cohort, when you're in your discussion boards, or I use Flipgrid so you can see and hear each other, you get to learn from each other from so many different places. And as you're in your practicums and student teaching, you're going to be able to see very diverse placements and understand what education is, not just in a nation, but across the world. And part of the reason some of you may have been attracted to our program is because you saw that it is highly rated by US News and World Report. 
Um, and that's something really, really to be proud about. And it's something that you can boast about as um, an EDCAT too. Any questions right here on this part? And if you're not comfortable unmuting, go ahead and type in the chat. And this is wait time. Um, um, sorry, may I, are you gonna say more about the student teaching and practicum experiences later? Absolutely. Okay. But go ahead and questions. ask your question. Nope, go oh, ahead and well, ask your question. I, I was just gonna, basically the question is just how it works. And I'd just be kind of curious how that, you know, all plays out, but I guess you'll get to that, so, okay. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Where's there? Okay, so I'm just gonna briefly show you elementary because if you're kind of wondering what should I do, um, I do know the elementary and the um, upper, um, upper school program, we sometimes call it overseas or the secondary program. Um, they're very similar in the way we run it. In some cases, you're going to be with some elementary um, trained teacher or training teachers for some of your coursework that crosses both programs. And basically, you start with the spring intercession and you go until the next spring one. So some of these courses, you will be intermixed. And then some of them are strictly your, um, your content area. Now, part of the reason I mentioned your, the elementary one, if you're not quite sure what you might want to do, one of the great advantages of being in the elementary program is once you are licensed an elementary teacher, you can take a praxis test in Kansas and test into a content area um, licensure for social studies or for science or for um, English language arts. That's not true the other way. You cannot get a secondary license and test down into elementary. You have to do some new practicums and some other coursework to be able to do that. So if you're really kind of sitting on the edge and you're not quite sure um, what your grade level would be, elementary is not a horrible choice. Um, like I said, I was a, a reading specialist. And so I've pretty much taught all grades at some point in my career. And their um, elementary is really fun too. As I said, my heart's in the middle, but um, for at least some of our places, our elementary uh, schools actually go up until sixth grade. And so that could be a choice for you. But just so you know that that's out there, um, the, the structure is basically the same, 31 credits in a master's degree, but with that licensure eligibility for elementary. And in Kansas, you can test up. This is what the MAT for secondary looks like. It follows pretty much the same pattern. It has some, like I said, some of the same courses. So you start in the May intercession, which is in the middle of May, and you look at the social foundations of education and you start um, putting some artifacts into your master's project. Over the summer, you take curriculum and instruction, uh, which is things like lesson planning and unit planning. You take diverse learners. Um, you take your first colloquium with me and we focus on writing over the summer. Then in fall, you have literacy and diverse learners in the content area that all secondary people take. And so in that class, you'll be with your um, social studies and math colleagues. You take your methods course with me while you're in your practicum. And you take your second colloquium with me and we focus on reading in that one. So in the fall, you will be doing practicum which is um, part-time in a school near you. And we help you, uh, we help you or you identify where you wanna be. And then we work with the school district to see if we can have a memorandum of understanding so that you are in that school with a teacher and the cooperating teacher, it really depends how much responsibility you get that first semester. Um, some are very happy to give you lots of support and have you teach uh, starting from day one. Others want you to do a lot more observation, um, but you're only in the school uh, part time. And Dr. Vons, I forget exactly how many hours that is for practicum. It's 64, 64 hours. I actually think that we have it marked as 66 in some places because it's always a question and I can't I can't get to the bottom of where I put 66, <laughs> but I put 66 somewhere. So that's spread out over several weeks. We typically start as soon as we can. So early September, 
And we typically try to get it done before Thanksgiving because that Thanksgiving to Christmas break is really crazy in schools and you're finishing up some of your coursework um, and looking toward your student teaching. So it's spread out and it's negotiated with uh, your cooperating teacher what times you're gonna be in that classroom. Now in the winter intercession, you take your last colloquium with me and we focus on putting all of these things together and how you can use um, English language arts for social justice and to help students be active citizens in the world. And then as you go into spring, you have your student or your teaching internship, which is what is traditionally called student teaching. And during your student teaching time, you are full time in the school with a cooperating teacher. Many cases, you're with the same one that you were in practicum. Um, so you have gotten to know that classroom and gotten to know that teacher very well. And you take an action research course during that time and you design an action research project based on a problem of practice that you're having within your student teaching. That semester, you're also finishing your master's project with as a portfolio that shows your mastery of the teaching standards that are required for um, Kansas State Department of Education. And then you graduate and it's exciting and you get your degree and you're ready to go and be a teacher after you, of course, apply for a teaching license and have passed the two or passed the two practices. One before you are admitted is for your content area. And then once you've taken your coursework, you're going to take your um, core praxis, which is basically teaching pedagogy. And your coursework is going to help you uh, prepare for that. So Travis. Do you have more specific questions that I did not answer about practicum and student teaching? Yeah, uh, no, you answered a lot. Thank you. I guess the one thing for me I was thinking about um, that you didn't mention exactly is would the person, the student get to choose the school or set that up? Or do you have a network of schools that you assign the person to? Like in my case, you know, being in Seoul, that's my biggest thing is I don't know how I would be able to, uh, to do the student teaching if I would do it online or if I would set that up on my own or, you know, so that, that's my question. That's a great question. And you are not the only person in that situation. So we do have people who are in international settings and we have a placement office that works with you. So uh, depending on where you are in your location, there may be an international school available to you. There may be a Department of Defense school that's available for you, right. or there may be um, local schools that teach in English that may be available. So our placement office will work for you to identify your location. What are the possibilities? And our placement office will start making inquiries around that area to see if we can get you something location-based. And if not, then we'll figure out another solution. And I should also say, it's a great, great question, that um, everyone fills out uh, what's, I think we still call it the star form. Star form. Mm -hmm. Where you put down, this is the school and the grade level. That's my first choice. Here's my second choice. Here's my third choice. <clears throat> and uh, I, I don't know, a couple of years ago, at least anyway, it was like 95% of the time we were able to give students their first choices. The only time that we're not is if uh, the school, for some reason, you know, maybe they have too many student teachers or, or something like that, so. Well, and so. one of the things we sometimes run into trouble is because this is video supervision. Um, so either you'll be recording yourself and sending in a video in most cases, or every now and then, I know we've had some live um, Zoom type video um, supervision like that. So the school does have to allow that to happen for us to have a memorandum of understanding for them. And if they can't do that, then we do need to find another school. Other questions right now? So how do you apply? Well, because you are here, as Dr. Font said in the beginning, um, that grad school application will be waived. So just email either Dr. Vance or you can do online. So Brittany or um, Diane will send you that voucher and you can um, waive that application. $65, nothing to sneeze at. That's a, a dinner out. Um, you do need to have an undergraduate uh, GPA of 3.0. However, 
Um, if you have some issues with that, please don't let that deter you from applying. Talk to Dr. Vonser, I, and let's see if there's things that we can do to um, navigate that situation. Um, because some of the best teachers are some of those who were the worst students. And I have to admit, I was a really bad student my first year in undergraduate that they actually asked me to leave. Yet here I am, I got a doctoral degree. So um, there are ways to work around it. So don't let that deter you. You will need to submit your unofficial transcript so that we can see you actually do have your undergraduate degree. For secondary, there is a praxis test that is based on the content. And uh, once you show that you're interested, or actually I should have put the test in there. I apologize for that. Let me grab that test. For secondary English, let's not share my screen for that. There is a lovely study guide that's available from ETS and you take this um, before you prepare or before you apply so that you can show that you have um, that content knowledge because this coursework is not, um, this is not English coursework. This is not English um, literature. It's not American literature. It's not composition. It's assumed that you have at least the basics of that because what the program is about is the pedagogy of teaching, both the general pedagogy and psychology of teaching and then the method specifically for English language arts. So if you look in the chat, um, the English language arts Praxis test is there. And let me now share my screen on that one. The lovely thing about ETS is that they do give you a wonderful study guide or study companion here and a study plan. And so the study companion looks like this. And it tells you exactly what the test is going to be like, uh, uh, shows you what types of questions are going to be on it. And then it gives you a breakdown on each of the things. Um, so here's the literature and here's informational texts and then language use, otherwise known typically as grammar and then writing, speaking and listening. So that's the study companion. And then this study plan, which is a Word document. And I have to share a different way. It goes through those same things and you rate yourself on what you know or what you might not know and where do you get the resources. So if you start going through this and you need some information about some of these resources, you can let me know and I can head you in the right direction for the resources. So that's a, a nice way to do a self assessment of that. Um, so Marissa has a question, Dr. Vance, this one's for you. Will the waiver remain good through the application deadline of April 1? The answer, yes. There you it go. Will, it will remain good until after April, April 1. So uh, yes, it will. So that's the Praxis test. Then as you apply, there will be um, a video requested of you and you can record this in anything and just put it on a private YouTube and just send us the link. And basically there's three questions that really talks about why do you wanna do this and how, um, what do you, what qualities you have that will make you successful in the program and especially successful in the classroom. So any of your past experiences um, you wanna talk about in those. You will also need letters of recommendation. And if um, English is not your first language, you may need to have an English language proficiency test. So the deadline is April 1st. If you are really interested, I would encourage you to look at that Praxis stuff as soon as possible. So you can arrange to take the Praxis test for secondary English. Um, you can retake the test if uh, you do not get a passing score. And um, you have to wait, I think it's 30 days before you take it a second time. We do work with people on this one too. So we've had a couple of people that didn't pass it the first time, but just, just were really, really close. 
Um, so we've worked with people about that one too. So again, don't let that deter you from applying. Um, one of the best things you can do, honestly, is take the test to see what it's like. And especially if you haven't done any kind of standardized tests like this, they're really different from like when I took the SAT. It's no longer bubble forms. It's all online. So it feels really different. Any questions on this part? I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, I graduated from uh, K-State's English master's program in 2020. Mm -hmm. Will I need, I imagine I'll need to do the interview questions, but will I need to repeat letters of recommendation uh, in a, in a packet for the department of education or the free all admissions? Will I need to repeat or can I use what I had on file um, and then just add the interview questions? Well, how would that be? Um, how, what would that look like? When did you, when, when did you apply with, for your master's degree in English? Um, 2018. Yeah, you're pro they'll probably make you, you know, yeah. I would be fine with you uh, using what you had before, but the graduate school is a little persnickety and mm -hmm. they watch over our shoulder. So the, I, my, my guess is, is that you'll need some, some current letters or recommendation. But by the way, they, they don't mm -hmm. have to be uh, onerous ones. Um, you know, uh, actually you just submit the their names and email mm -hmm. okay and, and then they just fill out a little rubric on you and yep. they, they they certainly can upload a, an actual letter or there's just a dialogue box where they can write a paragraph or two about you so that would work too okay and i would say especially because this is a different program this is for a licensure and teaching so um you probably want them to also talk about how they they believe you would interact with students because for regular masters it's all about like can you actually do the coursework and yes coursework is important but this is a teaching degree too so um you want people to be able to speak to how you interact with people other questions Just, uh, you know, you just mentioned this is a, a teaching degree, so I want to just make sure I understand what the degree is, because when I look at education programs, there are so many different kinds of degrees. There's like a education master's degree, the ed, ed, uh, there's all sorts of degrees, mm -hmm. and I um, majored in English literature, so I'm a little bit unfamiliar with it. So what is the difference, say, between a um, master's of arts in teaching versus one of the other types of, of degrees. I guess I'm asking that because I wonder if I got the certification, um, would I be required later down the road to get an a master's in education for promotion purposes or for just to keep up with the um, expectations of the school district um, or, or would that be the end uh, degree, the terminal in, degree? Um, you're never done learning in school districts. But yes, this is a master's degree in teaching, so MAT. Um, and so there's a master's degree and then there's licensure and they're actually two different price, uh, processes. We don't actually, as a college, issue the license. The state of Kansas issues that. So you're doing your coursework with us, you're doing your student teaching with us, you do your master's uh, project that shows you have mastered the um, learning outcomes. And then we recommend you for licensure at Can Kansas State Department of Education. And they're the ones that issue the license. However, it is a master's degree. So um, there are some people who say, for example, I'm also in charge of the reading specialist program. There's teachers who have a bachelor's degree and they get their license with their bachelor's degree. That's the traditional four-year route for most teachers. And once they get their bachelor's degree, some may choose to go on for a master's in something else. So in that case, because they already have that teaching license, they don't need to do a master's in teaching. They would do a master's in technology or reading specialist or English language learners or something else. 
and then they receive that master's also 31 credits, but it's just in a different area. So would you need to continue in your school district? Yes, but not another master's. All school districts require continuing education. And so your school district will have a process that you do that. Many people do take some master's courses and they can apply those credits for whatever the district's requirements are. Others do it through going to conferences. Um, some do it through professional um, organizations like doing um, Google master teacher certification. So you will need to do some ongoing um, continuing education for your school district, but you will not need to get another master's unless of course you want to. I do know some teachers who have two masters. I usually try to talk to them into a doctor degree rather than a second master's, but some of them are like, no, no, I'm happy with my master's. And, and you know, the, the, the truth is, is that the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the master of arts and teaching degree that, that, uh, uh, moniker that, uh, you know, that title um, has become relatively popular for degree programs, uh, as Dr. Perath said, that combine, um, you know, a master's degree with, with recommendation for teaching certification. But, you know, truth be told, there are lots of colleges and universities that offer an MED uh, degree with certification. So, uh, a master's degree uh, in education, uh, and that also leads to uh, a recommendation for certification. By the way, we're not the only ones. With all universities, um, you know, no, no, I don't know of any university that grants a teaching license, right? I mean, we no, all, they don't. They all have to go through the state because it's state level. Yeah, we all go through the state, so that that's not unique to K State. The Master of Arts in Teaching thing was just starting to become popular when we created our program. And so uh, we chose that name, but we could have gone with an MED and just said with certification, but mm -hmm. we decided to distinguish between our regular MEDs and, uh, and this program by calling it the, the Master of Arts in Teaching. And one of the big differences between the MAT and say my reading specialist is the MAT is really focused on beginning pedagogy, the theory and practice of teaching, where with my reading specialist, they've already, they've had to have taught for two years as a licensed teacher before they can actually get a reading specialist license. And so that one is advanced understanding of pedagogy specifically in literacy. So David has a really good question. Is this the best and most expedient way in your judgment to gain teaching credentials? So there's two things in there. Is this the best? Absolutely. <laughs> because of exactly that, we do have a really strong program to help you understand all of the things involved in teaching. Um, it's not just writing some lesson plans and being in the classroom. We do have strong programs in understanding diverse learning. You get um, teaching um, pedagogy, you get uh, philosophy of, or um, psychology and philosophy of teaching and learning. Um, so that what's, that's what makes it the best. It's not the most expedient because it does take a year. It's pretty good. A year is pretty good. But if you look at things like Teach for America, you get a couple courses over the summer and you dropped into a classroom. Now, most people from Teacher for America do not stay in the profession. And that's the part about the best. We prepare you to be the best teacher you can be. And we provide support all the way through. And then even once you are graduated, you are always at EdCat and you can always come back. And I have students who um, email me long after and say, hey, you had this great resource and I can't find it. Can you send it to me? Or I'm really struggling with this student. Do you have any ideas? And so once you're an EdCat, you're always an EdCat. And that's part of what makes us the best. Do you have more to offer or more questions with that one, David? No, that's very helpful. Um, a year actually sounds pretty good. I, you know, I'm just not aware of what the range or spectrum is in terms of uh, gaining teaching credentials specifically, which is where my gap is. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I have a background, but no teaching credential, what we, I was an undergrad, you know, and I haven't done it since. Mm -hmm. What we tried to do was um, with this program is, you know, Dr. Barath's 
told you one extreme example, and that's the Teach for America, which is just sort of initiation by fire, mm -hmm. and you're just thrown into the classroom. And we know that, that that doesn't work. And on the other end of the spectrum, David, is, um, you know, before we created the MAT, you would have called uh, K-State and we would have said, oh, yeah, we can help you out. You want to be a teacher? Yeah. First of all, you need to move to Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, then you need to basically spend two or three years redoing an undergraduate degree uh, so you can you can be an English language arts teacher. And that um, so so this program aims for uh, the middle. But, you know, there's not very many uh, MAT programs. I encourage people to shop around. Uh, there's not too many that you can do in a year. There's not too many that, that cost $15,000. You know, USC has a great program, University of Southern California. It's online too. You could, you too could be a student at USC for $55,000 and, and two years of your, your life for, uh, again, a master of arts in teaching and a, recommendation uh, for a teaching license. So we're pretty confident that, and you know, we're in the US News and World Report top 10, not bad for uh, a school out on the plains uh, as we are at, at K-State. So uh, we're pretty confident in the, the quality uh, and expediency of our program. And David, if you're really interested, if you go to the Kansas State uh, Department of Education, they do have a handout that talks about the alternative ways for teaching certification. And you can look at that and see if it applies to your situation. Um, but a lot of cases um, for alternative certification, it is we are desperate and we're going to give you uh, an emergency license and here's your classroom. <laughs> Which can be problematic. That actually leads to a question. Are you aware of students who, MAT students who are in the classroom on a provisional or some sort of a thing like that while they're doing the MAT curriculum? Great, great question, David. We have a proposal uh, in front of the Kansas State Department of Education currently uh, for um, a residency program at K-State. So it's likely to go through we don't know for sure if it will, but if it does, uh, then the basic parameters of the program are, uh, you find someone that, that needs a teacher and wants to hire you, you become a full-time teacher. And instead of doing the program in, in 12 months, the program is spread out over 18 months, but you're a full-time teacher those 18 months and, and you're being paid as a full-time teacher uh, as well, so. And you have the full-time support of us as teacher educators, which with some alternative certifications, you don't have any support other than we need a body in the classroom. Right, that's a good point. And uh, so chances are very good we'll have that in place, but that's not, uh, again, the kind of thing where we uh, find you a job. That That's the, the, the responsibility of finding a job is on, on the student and then uh, then we'll make the rest of it happen. Thank you, does that tend to be long-term sub or is it actual uh, faculty position? It's actual faculty position. And um, so you would be given, if this goes through, you would be given a, what's called a restricted license. And you'd have to do this little kind of week long intensive course in August, uh, online course in August. Um, and uh, there's some other things that you'd be doing with your school district to get you ready for, you know, the, those first days of school and the first weeks of school and all that kind of stuff. But um, no, you're, you're not a long term sub you're the, you're the actual teacher and you start accruing teacher benefits. That's actually a great segue. I have a, a, a question as, um, you know, a single income earner. I uh, wanted to get kind of feedback on what other students have done during their internship to, to get income, because obviously a part-time job is just not going to cut it with the inflation that's happening and rise in rent costs. So how um, have you seen other students be successful and not get behind financially to pursue teaching? Great question. 
So that goes into our next one, funding your MAT. So you are eligible to apply for many of these things, um, depending on also where you want to teach, there may be some other um, benefits that you can apply for. So you do have loan forgiveness, you've got some scholarships you can apply for and um, the student loan program. And then um, there's definitely scholarships depending on what your background is. So like my dad was part of a union and I could apply for something because he was part of a union. Now we do not recommend that you try to work during your student teaching and even in the fall semester with your practicum, you are taking a full load of master's level courses plus doing those 63 to 66 hours of practicum. Um, and it is really difficult to work during this. So it is something that you do have to navigate. Um, some people do work on the weekends, but a lot of people need that to do the, the reading and the work. So it is a year that you're going to take a hit um, because it is really hard unless you can navigate something like, um, you know, there's some school districts that will give you an incentive to student teach with them. And if you sign on afterwards, um, they'll give you a bonus so you can use that to go back and, and pay off some things. Dr. Bonds, do you have anything more to add to that one? Yeah, the uh, the big thing is the $4,500 or so of free money that's available to them. I think it's on the next slide. Uh, if you are willing to teach in uh, Kansas uh, for one year after you graduate, you can get 22 to be specific, 2217 in the fall, 2217 in the spring. Love to give you that in the summer too, but for some reason they don't do it in the summer. Uh, and this is offered by the Kansas Board of Regents and it's not K-State dependent. But again, all you have to do is agree that, yeah, I'm gonna teach in Kansas for a year afterwards. And um, and so that, that pays for a third of it. And I'd say, you know, elementary may be a little bit different. I, I'm a, I oversee the whole thing, but I'm directly responsible for the elementary portion of the program. And I would say, at least 60% of our elementary students continue working during uh, the fall semester. Maybe not full time, but they uh -huh. continue to work uh, some during the fall semester. And, and again, the idea of a, a residency program, and we need English language arts uh, teachers. Uh -huh. And so if that goes through, uh, and by the way, you'd still have to apply for the MAT anyway. And uh, so, you, you know, you don't have to wait to apply until you know whether or not that's going to go through with the State Department. You can apply. There's no risk. We'll pay for your application uh, fee. But um, we should know about that late spring, early summer, I would guess. So unfortunately, there's not an easy answer to that one. And it really depends on, you know, you know your own ability to juggle multiple things. Um, even with my reading specialist, there should, they asked me, should I take one or two uh, classes every in the fall? And I'm like, you know your teaching load, you know your roles and your responsibilities. Are you caretaker, all of that kind of stuff. Um, if, if you wanna have more one-on-one -on -one conversation, I'm happy to do that. Um, but yeah, student teaching, it is really hard to, to take on another job. Some people do it. They kind of forgo sleep for a semester. Not the healthiest of things, but for a semester, some people do it. Um, and fall, like I said, you, you've got a, a pretty heavy course load plus your practicum, but people do work part-time um, in fall sometimes. Because that was the next one. <laughs> I think we covered, can I continue working? Um, you might sack some stuff away over the summer. <laughs> uh, we talked about field um, experiences. The license you will get is a Kansas license. That's what we recommend you for. If you are in another state or if you plan to move to another state, having a license in any state makes it easier to get a license in the next state because you've already gone through an approved teaching program. 
However, once you go to another state, um, you will have to see if they have some more specific requirements to get their license. I encourage anybody, whenever you get a teaching license in any state, make sure you keep up that license. Because once you lose it, you have to go back and, and pick up all of the extra requirements. So keep whatever initial license you have. And then if you move any place, transfer it to that or get an additional license in that state. And um, the state will work with you. They all have like different pathways to um, teaching licenses and one of them is out of state. And it'll tell you exactly what requirements you have. You might have to take another test or you might have to take a course and quite often those are online at this point. Um, and then um, you will have two licenses. So yeah, and, and sometimes people get confused, Dr. Paraf, they, they look, I think we had somebody from Tennessee on, and you look uh, at the requirements to become a teacher in Tennessee in English language, right? and you look at our program and, and those don't matter. Well, that's not what you're doing. You're gonna get a Tennessee uh, student, you're gonna get a, a Kansas teaching license uh, when you're done with the MAT uh, from the state of Kansas. And then you're gonna take that, that, that teaching license and you're gonna tell Tennessee, hey, I have my Kansas T uh, uh, English language arts uh, license and I wanna transfer it to Tennessee. So you're not starting from scratch in Tennessee or Hawaii or wherever you wanna teach. You, you, you begin with a, with a license in hand. There's a difference between those things. So, um, so that's important. And it's not like citizenship. If you've got a, a license in Kansas and you transfer it to Tennessee, they don't take away your Kansas one. <laughs> exactly. So I yeah. still have my license in, in Wisconsin, um, even Actually, though I'm in Kansas it, now. It, it, increasingly uh, in, in citizen, in terms of citizenship, they don't do that uh, as much anymore either. I don't know if you know no, that. No, they don't. The, there's, uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people that are, citizens of multiple uh, countries now. Um, Travis has a question. Does the Kansas Teaching Scholarship apply only to certain schools like the Loan Forgiveness Program? Uh, no, the, the Kansas Teacher Service Scholarship is, uh, I teach and you can teach in any school, just teach for a year uh, afterwards. Uh, in fact, uh, do you, I, I can uh, share my screen and just show it to him real quick if you want me sure. to. I will stop share and you can share. And um, great question about why is there a teaching shortage? And I mean, that could go on for a really, really long time. Um, but <laughs> COVID um, and a lot of times, especially in Kansas, it is because um, People, once they come to like big cities like Manhattan, they don't want to go back to their hometown. <laughs> and so there's there's pockets of area that are really short. Like in Manhattan, we if we have an opening, we have multiple people apply for it. But if you're in um, Goodland, Kansas, you might only have two or three people apply for it. So part of it has to do with location too. Part of it has to do with uh, just culture or culture. Mm -hmm. You know, to be honest with you, it, it's the craziest uh, thing. Uh, you know, we talk all the time about how important pol politically we talk all the time about how important education is, how important teachers are, uh, all that kind of stuff. But when push comes to shove, we really don't put our money where our mouth is, for one thing. And um, and, you know, just putting the money thing aside for a second uh, we just don't treat teachers uh, as well as other cultures do, to be honest with you. And uh, mm -hmm. so I think that that's another reason why uh, we don't have a, a lot of people uh, in the profession. But let me tell you, the flip side of that is, is that there's a ton of opportunity in teaching. You know, I went to not, not to bore you, but I went to this <laughs> thing a long time ago at the Wharton School of Business, right? The, the number one business school in the world, uh, you know, at, 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 at Penn. And it was a, it was a conference and, and, and not all conferences are created equally. And this conference was unbelievable. You know, it's the Wharton School. 
And uh, there's all these people that are wearing shoes uh, that cost as much as my car and, uh, you know, uh, things like that. So, um, and the entire conference is about entrepreneurship and education, not not how to teach entrepreneurship, but how to be entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial your, yourself. And, um, and it, was just, it was just spellbinding how many people um, you know, made the point that there are millions and billions, uh, I guess, of dollars uh, floating around out there in education. Uh, that are, you know, waiting for uh, people with a great idea to take advantage of. Now, I'm not a rich guy that has made a whole bunch of money off of education, but I have been a, a kind of education entrepreneur in that, you know, and I think all teachers are, you can kind of craft uh, what you're doing, what you're going to do next, because there's so many opportunities. There's vertical mobility. There's horizontal mo mobility. You can take that teaching license and move anywhere uh, in the United States. Y you can uh, teach for a few years and become a, a, an assistant principal or a curriculum de developer or uh, a professor or uh, a, a, you know, a, a textbook writer or a web developer or uh, teachers are uh, and our, our set of skills uh, are increasingly in demand. Being able to work with people of all different backgrounds. and my, my daughter's in her second year teaching in Kansas City, Kansas at Central Middle School. Are you kidding me? What a great uh, set of experiences, you know, she's getting, you know, every day, you know, she confronts a hundred little sixth graders that are, you know, filled with energy and ideas and uh, from different cultures and backgrounds. And somehow she has to try to make magic and make meaning. She's a social studies teacher uh, and, and try to get them uh, curious about world history uh, every day. Are you kidding me? You can say a lot of things about teaching, but don't ever say that it's not interesting or that it's boring. Uh, it, is, uh, it is awesome. I mean, I'm 56 years old and I still... I still love teaching. I, the first day of school still gives me butterflies. And, uh, you know, I still look forward to meeting new students and to, to tackling new challenges and to, to making my uh, courses a little bit better, to perfecting my rubrics and uh, how, I, how I describe things and the analogies that I uh, provide or whatever else, uh, you know, is uh, that I'm working on in my teaching at that moment. So it's an unbelievably rewarding and satisfying uh, a career. It's intellectually challenging and stimulating. And, um, you know, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Uh, like I said, a lot of my friends are about my age and they're burned out uh, on whatever it is that they're doing. You know, they've been being a lawyer for too long or they've been doing architecture for too long or whatever. And I still feel like I'm just getting started and I've been doing it for 30 years. Okay, so sh show us your page. Okay, so that was my little two cents. On. <laughs> and here's the can. Oh, there's the Kansas nursing. Just in case you wanted to see that uh, Kansas Teacher Service Scholarship. So here's the information PDF. And um, but you'll see here. Um, uh, where are the high needs areas listed? Uh, uh, oh, elementary, English language arts, mathematics, science, special education. Now, you don't need to worry about the underserved geographic areas, whoever asked that question, uh, because you're in one of the hard to fill. Now, my daughter's social studies, right? So she did this but she's not in a hard to fill discipline. So she's serving in an underserved geographic area, Kansas City, Kansas. See how that works? And, uh, but this is a great program and that's just uh, citizen money out there, public money uh, because 
what you do as English language arts teachers or elementary teachers or uh, mathematics, science, special ed, we need you and it's for the public good. And again, this isn't needs, if you apply, you get this. I don't know if I mentioned that, but uh, I've never had anyone not, not get this. It's not needs based, it's not academic based. It's, um, it is just, um, uh, we, we wanna encourage people to, to do this. This is undergraduate amounts. So that's why my amounts uh, look different. There's that. Any other questions? I'm a little. Uh, I'm a little torn. Um, my undergraduate is in political science and history, and I'm. I'm interested in getting dual certified. I was told um, to get what you're most passionate and ready to teach right now first, and then to take the praxis and and later on add those endorsements. Sure. So I'm, I'm leaning towards um, ELA because I have a, a master's in English already and I've taught at the college level, but I really wanna teach middle school and high school. So, um, but I'm also really interested in uh, ESL and I know that's really a high need field. Um, so what, what's your advice there? Is there a place to start? Should I start with ESL or maybe ELA and then build on top of that? What, what would that trajectory look like? I would, uh, you know, I'm a little biased. Now I'm a, I'm a social studies uh, person, right? So I taught, I taught uh, history, uh, civics, government, political science. In fact, I just did lectures, uh, to, recorded lectures for colleagues in Bosnia about democracy and human rights. Uh, so um, you and I could have some great uh, talks about, about government and, and, and civics. But I gotta be honest with you, that not all subject areas were created equally. I mean, I work with, I, I work primarily, even though I was a high school teacher, I work primarily with elementary uh, folks and they'll tell you, I mean, at, do, a, do a poll of elementary teachers and they'll tell you not all, and they teach, they, elementary teachers are responsible for teaching English language arts, mathematics, social studies, and science, right? All of those. And sometimes ELA and, and uh, or uh, English, uh, ESL and, and so forth. But they'll tell, uh, a, a large majority of elementary teachers will tell you that teaching reading uh, takes precedent over uh, the other subject areas. And you know what? As a parent of four kids, I'm glad that my elementary teachers stressed uh, reading and uh, the language arts skills. I mean, they're, they're just so, Maggie, foundational for, for learning, for life, uh, you know, that uh, I think that I would start there and uh, and then uh, branch out into social studies or into something else if if it were me. I mean, it's just so so important. Being able to interpret, uh, you know, uh, you know, just interpret reading and writing, comprehend, and and uh, being able to 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 listen carefully or or, or or speak or write clearly. I mean, it's just it's so critical to uh, success um and life fulfillment and you know lots of other uh liberal uh education ideas uh, liberal not in the liberal conservative political spectrum but liberal in the philosophical uh sense well and also very practically i don't think there are any english language learning or esl masters with teaching certification programs <laughs> So um, our MAT is an initial teaching license recommendation. Um, so that's really where you, you, you would need that initial teaching license in something to be able to go to something else. And I don't think there's anybody that does an initial teaching license only in English language um, learners for at the master's level. And even as a social studies teacher, I, uh, I spent a lot of time teaching writing. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of, we even did a, 
the kids all were mad at me because I stressed writing so much and graded their writing hard and all that kind of stuff. And so uh, th they were complaining that I stressed uh, some things that their English teachers didn't and vice versa, and which is just normal, right? Uh, but we got together with the English department, the social studies department. I taught a big high school, 2000 kids. And uh, we created a writing handbook, a little, you know, little writing handbook that we all, all the faculty members agreed to, if you're going to do a research paper, you know, these are the, the criteria, the standards that we're going to go by. If, we're, if you do an essay on a, a test, these are the criteria that we're going to go by and, and so forth. So. And I've had the advantage of being able to truly teach a humanities block that integrated social studies and English. Um, they still did receive two different grades, but I could do everything together. And so we, we read social studies and we did ancient civilizations and uh, Chinese empires and things like that. And then they did their English language arts work through that. So. Okay, we should wrap this up because we're into oh over an hour. Um, if you are interested in applying, you kind of know where to go at this point. Um, so click on the how to apply. And that's not a clickable link. Go to online K-State, there we go. We'll put that in the chat room and then how to apply. Um, but make sure that you email either um, Diane or Brittany or Dr. Vance to get you that voucher for the wavering of the application fee of $65. And if you want more spe specific information or just want to have a one on one about English language arts specifically and how the program works and what types of things you're going to do, you are welcome to set up a time with me and I'm happy to zoom with anybody. I like to talk. It makes me happy. So um, you're welcome to do that. If you want to know any other like vague generalities or other choices through the MAT, Dr. Vance is your person to go to. I am Mr. Vague Generality. And, <laughs> uh, and but I also <laughs> I also give my uh, cell phone number there. So you if you have any trouble uh, uh, making an application or have questions about your application, don't don't uh, hesitate and uh, give me a call. It was great. Thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. It was great meeting all of you. I want all of you to become K-Staters. And um, if, uh, if we can do anything to help convince you, uh, we're a phone call or an email away. Dr. Parath, anything else? Have a great Thanksgiving. Yeah, everyone. Have a great Thanksgiving and hope to see you uh, in a K-State class soon. We'll stick around if you have any specific questions. Otherwise, have a wonderful night. Thank you.